It is the fall of 1956. The American writer James Michener is in Austria, and he's watching history unfold. He's standing five miles from the tiny village of Andau, right at the border between Austria and Hungary, along that dividing line which has come to be called the Iron Curtain. Michener finds it hard to believe what he's seeing before his very eyes. The author of a long series of bestsellers has seen much in life already. Service in the Pacific with the U.S. Navy during World War II led him to write Tales of the South Pacific, which has been turned into a Broadway music hit and already won him the Pulitzer Prize. Michener's career as an author of more than 40 books, many of them history-spanning sagas, has already been launched. But he has never seen anything like this. A mass migration of this scale. Epic human tragedy on the march. He calls it one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Here, where Austria and Hungary meet, there's a tiny footbridge, not even wide enough for a car, just some boards hammered together with a shaky handrail. The bridge leads over a filthy canal and then onto Austria and the village of Andau. Michener says this must be about the most inconsequential bridge in Europe. But for several weeks in 1956, it becomes what he calls one of the most important bridges in the world, for across its unsteady planks fled the soul of a nation. Over 20,000 Hungarian refugees, fleeing the Soviet crackdown in their country, hurry over the bridge. As they vote with their feet, Michener is struck by how young this mass of people is, their average age being 23, including young cu couples with babies. Michener is impressed also by their spirit of determination, their sense of purpose, their idealism. As they make their exodus, beginning their exile, Michener senses a blend of sorrow and fierce joy. He's not alone. Michener observes some of the world's toughest news reporters, photographers, and refugee aid officials standing here with, steer, with tears starting to flow from their eyes. What's the meaning of this gripping scene? As we will see in this lecture, the 1950s and 1960s were marked by repeated revolts in Eastern Europe, even in the face of regimes that demanded total obedience to their ideology. Each revolt, even as it ultimately failed, seemed to offer lessons for the next round of disobedience and the rise of a wider movement of dissent and principled unrest across all Eastern European countries. As we will observe, persistent resistance in Eastern Europe often fed both on historical memories from the past and fresh hopes for the future. The first of the uprisings came in June 1953, just after the death of Stalin in East Germany, and it acquired the compelling name in German of the Arbeiteraufstand, that is, the Workers' Uprising, against a regime that claimed it was the true representative of the working class. When Stalin died in March of 1953, many hoped finally for a relaxation of tension and regimentation. The East German authorities promised reforms and more consumer goods, but they also raised work quotas by 10%. In East Berlin, construction workers who were laboring to build the imposing Stalin Boulevard, the Stalinallee, reacted by simply putting down their tools. Their protests then accelerated as economic demands about work norms and quotas expanded to political ultimatums. The protesters demanded truly free elections, democracy, and the resignation of the communist boss Walter Ulbricht. By June 17th, the strike had grown into full revolt, and it spread beyond Berlin to other cities, especially Halle and Leipzig. Almost half a million workers went on strike in 593 work sites in East Germany, and 140 government buildings, including city halls, party and police branches, were occupied by protesters. As it lost control, the East German state asked the Soviet patrons to help quell the revolt. On June 18th, Soviet tanks rolled in. Protesters threw rocks and bottles at the tanks, 
but the protests were crushed with violence and mass arrests. Over 200 civilians were killed, and some hundred policemen died in the fighting as well. The Soviets arrested 6,000 people, over half of them striking workers. The Communist Party leadership was purged because of this crisis, and 20 party officials were executed for not stopping the emergency earlier. But this proved a victory that was disastrous, even in symbolic terms for the East German state. Think about the implications of the working class revolting against communism. For Marx, the working class had almost a sacred status because its historical role was unique. By liberating itself, Marx had argued, it would liberate all of humanity from any oppression. Yet now, instead of the Leninist party being the vehicle of that savior class, the workers had revolted against it. The lesson here was that the state came first and would use violence and foreign tanks, if necessary, to assert its claim to absolute primacy. But the Soviets were determined to hold the line in the Cold War, and in 1955, they engineered the so-called Warsaw Pact as an Eastern counterpart to NATO in the West. The Warsaw Pact included Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, Romania, Albania, and the Soviet Union. The pact made vividly clear that the Soviet Union was the big brother, ready to reimpose order in a fraternal way. So a joke made the rounds. Are the Russians our friends or are they our brothers? And the answer was, well, clearly they were brothers because you can choose your friends. The next major crisis was not slow in arriving. In 1956, the new Soviet General Secretary of the Communist Party, Nikita Khrushchev, inaugurated a so-called thaw, stepping back from Stalinist terror. He started with his secret speech at the 20th Party Congress of the Soviet Communist Party. In this speech, Khrushchev criticized Stalin for his cult of personality and his abuses, especially of fellow communists. The speech was stunning for many in the audience, and the Polish Stalinist Bolesław Bierut may have died of shock as a result of hearing the speech. But there was a lot that Khrushchev did not include in his comments, like his own role as one of Stalin's helpers. Nor did he discuss events like the Ukrainian famine, which is remembered today as the Holodomor. This was an incomplete reckoning with the past. The secret speech was leaked by Polish officials to Israeli intelligence, who then handed it to the CIA. So soon the secret speech was common knowledge. Throughout Eastern Europe, the speech raised many expectations for change and a move away from Stalinist forms of rule. Workers in Poznan in Poland gathered for mass protests in June 1956, which again, like in Berlin three years before, arose from basic economic questions. Polish security forces crushed the unrest, but it next flared up in Hungary. The Hungarian People's Republic had been under the rule of the Stalinist leader, Matyas Rakosi. Rakosi was the fellow who had bragged about salami slice tactics in Stalinizing Eastern Europe. And once in power, he enforced his rule with the feared secret police, called the AVH, the Alem Vedelmi Hatoshag, or State Protection Agency. Opposition was crushed. Cardinal Jozef Mincenti was arrested and imprisoned for life, and Rakoshi followed the Stalinist routine of show trials, purges, and five-year plans. But when Stalin died and Khrushchev pressed for change, Rakoshi was forced out. And a new set of Hungarian communist leaders, with Prime Minister Imre Naj at the fore, tried to de-Stalinize their country. But expectations among the population at large soon outran their plans. Young intellectuals invoked Magyar heroes of the past, especially with the founding of the Shandor Petufi Circle, hearkening back to the days of the Revolution of 1848. This debating society started raising fundamental questions about the future. Soon, on October 23, 1956, larger student protests began in Budapest and grew in size. Student protesters also started gathering at another 
historically resonant spot. That was the statue of Polish general Józef Bem, who fought on the Hungarian side against Austria in 1848 and 1849. This was in fact meant as a gesture of solidarity with Polish protests that were taking place around the same time. Workers and ordinary city dwellers in Budapest joined in until the crowds along the Danube River at the parliament included 200 to 300,000 people. When the crowd was told to go home as it got dark, one person set fire to a newspaper and soon the Parliament Square was flickering with the glow of many newspapers set on fire, showing the power of numbers. Even Hungarian police and army were joining the protesters. Soon Soviet flags were being torn down, and Hungarian flags, which had at their center the communist emblem, had that emblem cut out from the middle, and they were carried through the streets. These flags with a hole in the center became a symbol of the revolt as a whole. At City Park in Budapest, protesters tore down the 25-foot-high Stalin statue, cutting it away at his boots. Cardinal Mincenti, who back in 1949 had been tortured and subjected to a show trial, was now freed from prison. But then, a few hours later, Soviet forces stationed inside Hungary moved in against the protesters. They feared a repetition of the Berlin workers' uprising. This inflamed the Hungarian populace even more and turned protest into an armed revolt. On October 25th, a crowd gathered at Kossuth Square next to the huge parliament building to hear Imre Naj speak. They were shot at by Hungarian and Soviet soldiers and at least 70 were killed. A new government was now announced with Naj as prime minister. The Hungarian Workers Party dissolved itself. And the parties that the communists had banned earlier now came roaring back to life. Naj announced that the AVH, the secret police, was also being dissolved. Their Soviet trainers, KGB officers, promptly fled the country in a special airplane. Soviet troops were withdrawn from Budapest to calm down the population. This, however, actually increased the sense of the protesters that they were winning. And now they demanded that Soviet troops pull out of Hungary as a whole, and that Hungary withdraw from the Warsaw Pact, and they asked for help from the West. The United States, Britain, and France, however, were at this point entirely engaged in the Suez Canal crisis that was unfolding at this moment in the Middle East and couldn't spare attention. In the streets, protesters killed AVH officers and party officials as the situation escalated ever further. Then, on November 4th, Soviet tanks were sent in again in what was called Operation Whirlwind. They shelled Budapest. In an early morning radio broadcast, directed not just towards Hungarians but at a global audience, Naj announced that Hungary was leaving the Warsaw Pact, and he appealed to the United Nations to defend Hungarian neutrality. In the fighting that took place in the streets, young Hungarians battled armored vehicles and even in this mismatched clash, they found various ways to disable the tanks. They spread oil on the streets so that tanks would skid out of control and would get trapped between buildings. Young boys and girls ran up to tanks and shoved metal bars into the tank treads so that the tanks couldn't move. The fighters also dug ditches and filled them with gasoline that would be lit when a tank tried to cross. One fighter remembered with astonishment I didn't think girls could do what I saw them do. Young women of Budapest hid in doorways until a tank ran into an obstacle, and then they ran up to attack the tank with homemade bombs. In the week that followed, around 2,500 protesters were killed and some 20,000 wounded, and nearly 700 Soviet soldiers died in the fighting. Prime Minister Naj fled to the Yugoslav embassy, seeking asylum there. But later, he was tricked into coming out, was arrested, and executed. Cardinal Mincenti went to the American embassy, and there he was granted asylum. Mincenti would spend the next 15 years there in the embassy until he was finally allowed to leave the country. In the crackdown that followed, 35,000 arrests were made, and over 200 were executed. 
A mass exodus followed across the border to Austria. About 200,000 people fled the country. That's nearly 2% of the entire population, many of them never to return to their homeland. The West condemned the Soviet invasion of Hungary, but did nothing. Afterwards, there was debate about the role of Radio Free Europe, a radio station beaming news and commentary into Eastern Europe in many languages, funded by the United States, and whether it had nurtured false hopes of Western intervention. A witness to this aftermath was James Michener, whose observations we started this lecture with. Collecting refugee interviews, in 1957, he published his book, The Bridge at Andau, which still makes for astonishing reading over half a century later. The Kremlin picked Hungarian communist leader Janos Kadar to rule Hungary. It would not be easy to repair the situation. Worldwide, many communists quit their movement in protest. In the years that followed, Kadar slowly introduced economic reforms in Hungary, including the NEM, or New Economic Mechanism, which moved away from Stalinist centralism. More economic freedoms produced rising living standards in Hungary, and even the building of a factory in Budapest for Levi Strauss and Company to produce blue jeans. Such improvements and international loans made Hungary what some called the happiest barracks in the socialist camp, trading political helplessness for increased consumption. It was said that Hungary had pioneered so-called goulash communism, named after the national dish, a stew with fiery paprika spice. And many Eastern Europeans admired or envied Hungary from afar. Incidentally, you may actually know a concrete example of Hungary's greater connectedness to the West and the world in these decades. That's the famous puzzle toy, the multicolored twisting Rubik's Cube, that was invented in 1974 by the Hungarian architect Ernő Rubik. With over 350 million sold around the world, it's been called the best-selling toy ever. Soon after the Hungarian turmoil, a dramatic move showed the outer limits of choice. This was the building of the Berlin Wall, which was started without warning on August 13, 1961. The East German state had already closed the land border with West Germany, but it continued to hemorrhage people through the open city of Berlin, as almost 2.7 million Germans fled west. With Soviet permission, the East German leader Walter Ulbricht ordered the building of the wall, which was officially labeled the anti-fascist protection rampart. Its real aim was to keep people in, rather than spies or provocateurs out. Border troops guarded this wall with orders to shoot to kill, because flight from the Republic, as it was called, was a crime. Eleven days after the wall was built, the first one to be shot was a young worker, Günther Litvin, who was killed trying to escape. Some 900 people died along the entire border. After the wall was erected, a kind of grim stabilization set in in East Germany as citizens saw that they must somehow come to terms with what was now inevitable. But the wall blasted the myth of the state having popular support, and it became the symbol of East German communism. The next crisis started with such high hopes. This is the so-called Prague Spring of 1968 in Czechoslovakia. In fact, today, there's an annual international music festival by that name as well. The Slovak reformer Alexander Dubček was elected head of the Communist Party in January of 1968. He and fellow reformers pursued a course called Socialism with a Human Face, with loosened restrictions on speech and less centralized government. In response, fearing a repetition of the Berlin and Budapest scenarios, on the night of August 20th to the 21st, 1968, the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies mounted a surprise invasion called Operation Danube. Half a million troops poured in. Bitterly, this invasion included Hungarian troops, whose own country had recently been treated in a similar fashion. In the streets, Prague citizens argued with Soviet soldiers atop their tanks. One protester shouted, You are repeating Munich! You gave us freedom in 1945, and now you're taking it away. 
this shout is actually rich in historical memory in a really typically Eastern European way. Ironically, Czechs had long felt the attraction of ideas of pan-Slavic brotherhood, all the way back to the first pan-Slav Congress in Prague in 1848. They'd looked to the Russians as allies, including during the Second World War. Now, however, keen disillusionment set in. A further lesson suggested that this system could not be reformed, but would need to be replaced. There was no mass resistance, like in Hungary, but still, 100 Czechs and Slovaks were killed, and allegedly 12 Soviets were killed. The next year, in the central Wenceslas Square in Prague, a history student named Jan Palach set himself on fire to protest the invasion and died. Nevertheless, the Soviet Union under Leonid Brezhnev now codified the so-called Brezhnev Doctrine, which said once a country had gone over to the communist camp, there was no leaving. And this prompted jokes like this one. What is the most neutral country in the world? And the answer is, it is Czechoslovakia, which does not interfere even in its own internal affairs. The internal crackdown in Czechoslovakia that followed went by the bitterly ironic name of normalization. After these scenes of protesters battling Soviet tanks again and again in Berlin, Budapest, and Prague, a whole other range of examples of unrest grew in Eastern Europe in the 1970s, and these took myriad forms. In 1972, in Soviet Lithuania, a young man named Romas Kalanta burned himself to death on the central street in Kaunas in a desperate protest. Illegal underground publications proliferated. Many of them were laboriously typed out or even handwritten in what was called samizdat, from the Russian for self-publishing. Dissidents also drew inspiration from one another, as, for example, Eastern Europeans who admired the Russian Alexander Solzhenitsyn and his revealing of the realities of the gulags. Milan Kundera's novel, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, reflected on the Prague Spring, its suppression, and what that meant for human lives. The permanent rebel in Yugoslavia, Milovan Gilas, steered into repeated confrontations with the communist cause that he had earlier helped come to power. Religious protest was also active. In Lithuania, for 17 years, an entire underground network secretly published the so-called Chronicle of the Lithuanian Catholic Church, which was simply a terse inventory of police persecution of believers. In Romania, the ethnic German community was subjected to discrimination, and the dissident writer Hertha Müller transmuted her personal experience of state terror into art. After refusing to inform for the Securitate, mistreatment finally led her to emigrate to West Germany, and she went on to win the Nobel Prize for Literature in 2009. We already talked in an earlier lecture about political jokes, also a form of dissidence. Because of the total claims of the state, every joke, in a sense, was political, and these jokes proliferated. In fact, there were even jokes about jokes, like this one. There are three kinds of people. There are people who tell jokes. Then there are people who collect jokes and tell jokes. I really identify with that category. And then, of course, there is the kind of person who collects people who tell jokes. That is, the government and the secret police. Escaping or emigrating or defecting was also a form of protest, and it produced this famous joke. What is an Eastern European string quartet? Well, it's a symphony orchestra after its tour in the West. Inspired by the youth counterculture that was sweeping the United States and Western Europe, hippies also appeared in Eastern Europe, as far away as Riga, Latvia, and Lviv in Ukraine. The American historian William J. Risch has studied the Ukrainian hippies. They wore homemade bell-bottom jeans, beads, and sandals. The women had long flowing locks, and the men beards and long hair. Such flower children worried the authorities, who labeled them bourgeois, or nationalist, precisely because of their nonconformity. Hippies would often be harassed by communist youth activists of their own generation. In September 1977, when the hippies gathered in Lviv for a rock concert to the memory of Jimi Hendrix, 
Police agents swooped in and arrested 500 of them. Who knew what dangers lurked in their, in their slogans such as, be yourself, or love flowers and don't make politics of it. Being a dissident was often a dangerous choice. In the Soviet Union, they could be confined to psychiatric hospitals on the dubious logic that being a malcontent under this perfect regime was obviously a sign of madness. Even exile was not safe. In 1978, the Bulgarian secret police, with assistance from the KGB, used a poisoned umbrella gun to kill the Bulgarian dissident and journalist Georgi Markov in London. Markov was waiting for a bus on the Waterloo Bridge when someone stabbed him from behind with a poison-tipped umbrella. At first, he thought nothing of what was really a slight wound, but then he came down with a high fever, and he died four days later. A post-mortem revealed that he had been injected with the toxin ricin. Among the many forms of dissidence and unrest, one of the most powerful expressions came from a Czech playwright who would spend years in prison for his thought crimes and yet after the collapse of communism became the president of his country. This was Václav Havel, born in Prague in 1936. Because his father had been a factory owner, the communist state opposed his ambitions for higher education. Havel launched his career writing plays in an absurdist style. His best-known play was The Memorandum from 1965. It involved the creation of a new language of officialdom, not Esperanto, but a language perfect for control, revealing the unconscious absurdity of bureaucracy. Havel played an active role in the 1968 Prague Spring. As a result, when normalization descended on his country, his works were banned. He was arrested repeatedly and imprisoned from 1979 to 1983. Before his imprisonment, Havel was among the founders of a Czechoslovak group called Charter 77. The arrest of a rock band with the unforgettable name Plastic People of the Universe provoked the founding of this group, which insisted that the communist government honor the human rights pledges it had signed in the Helsinki Accords in 1975. Communist governments, including the Soviet Union, had viewed these Helsinki Accords as a way of ratifying the permanence of their control in Eastern Europe, not as legally binding or meaningful. But Charter 77 aimed to prove otherwise. Havel wrote a powerful essay in 1978 entitled The Power of the Powerless. He opened with these words, A specter is haunting Eastern Europe, the specter of what in the West is called dissent. Havel first explained that the system ruling Eastern Europe was what he called post-totalitarian. That is, the stage of totalitarian dictatorship that came after Stalin. Incidentally, this was part of a huge irony. As scholars in the West were discarding the concept of totalitarianism, it was, at this point, being taken up by thinkers in Eastern Europe. This system involved the constant and total manipulation of society so that people would conf uh, conform mouth the official slogans, and live a lie following the ruling ideology. Yet Havel painted this alternative scene. What if a greengrocer, who was required to put in his window the political slogan, workers of the world unite, just didn't do it? Havel, in fact, didn't like the title dissident as a job description, as he argued that under a system like this, just doing your job or trying to be true to yourself could put you in opposition to the state. Havel was convinced that the right thing to do was not any politicized dissent, nor, and this is very interesting, nor to be like the good soldier Schweik and be ironic. Instead, Havel said, one should just refuse to live a lie, instead being determined to live in truth, to engage in authentic human relationships. Together, these set the independent life of society, Havel argued, what we might call civil society, apart from the power of the state. Havel suggested that immense potential power lay in not being afraid to live as a responsible individual in truth. This message and other impulses of resistance and unrest we have discussed would lead to the breakdown of the system with the rise of solidarity in Poland, as we'll see in our next lecture.